Chapter 1 of The Tower Treasure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. Chapter 1 The Speed Demon. After the help we gave Dad on that forgery case, I guess he'll begin to think we could be detectives when we grow up. Why shouldn't we? Isn't he one of the most famous detectives in the country? And aren't we his sons? If the profession was good enough for him to follow, it should be good enough for us. Two bright-eyed boys on motorcycles were speeding along a shore road in the sunshine of a morning in spring. It was Saturday, and they were enjoying a holiday from the Bayport High School. The day was ideal for a motorcycle trip, and the lads were combining business with pleasure by going on an errand to a nearby village for their father. The older of the two boys was a tall, dark youth, about 16 years of age. His name was Frank Hardy. The other boy, his companion on the motorcycle trip, was his brother Joe, a year younger. While there was a certain resemblance between the two lads, chiefly in the firm yet good-humored expression of their mouths, in some respects they differed greatly in appearance. While Frank was dark, with straight black hair and brown eyes, his brother was pink-cheeked, with fair curly hair and blue eyes. These were the Hardy Boys, sons of Fenton Hardy, an internationally famous detective who had made a name for himself in the years he had spent on the New York police force and who was now, at the age of 40, handling his own practice. The Hardy family lived in Bayport, a city of about 50,000 inhabitants located on Barmet Bay, three miles in from the Atlantic, and here the Hardy Boys attended high school and dreamed of the days when they too should be detectives detectives like their father. As they sped along the narrow shore road with the waves breaking on the rocks far below, they discussed their chances of winning over their parents to agreement with their ambition to follow in the footsteps of their father. Like most boys, they speculated frequently on the occupation they should follow when they grew up, and it had always seemed to them that nothing offered so many possibilities of adventure and excitement as the career of a detective. But whenever we mention it to Dad, he just laughs at us, said Joe Hardy. Tells us to wait until we're through school, and then we can think about being detectives. Well, at least he's more encouraging than Mother, remarked Frank. She comes out plump and plain and says she wants one of us to be a doctor and the other a lawyer. What a fine lawyer either of us would make, sniffed Joe, or a doctor either. We were both cut out to be detectives, and Dad knows it. As I was saying, the help we gave him in that forgery case proves it. He didn't say much, but I'll bet he's been thinking a lot. Of course, we didn't actually do very much in that case, Joe pointed out. But we suggested something that led to a clue, didn't we? That's as much a part of detective work as anything else. Dad himself admitted he would never have thought of examining the city tax receipts for that forged signature. It was just a lucky idea on our part, but it proved to him that we can use our heads for something more than to hang our hats on. Oh, I guess he's convinced all right. Once we get out of school, he'll probably give us his permission. Why, this is a good sign right now, isn't it? He asked us to deliver these papers for him in Willowville. He's letting us help him. I'd rather get in on a real good mystery, said Frank. It's all right to help Dad, but if there's no more excitement in it than delivering papers, I'd rather start in studying to be a lawyer and be done with it. Never mind, Frank, comforted his brother. We may get a mystery all of our own to solve some day. If we do, we'll show that Fenton Hardy's sons are worthy of his name. Oh, boy, but what wouldn't I give to be as famous as Dad? Why, some of the biggest cases in the country are turned over to him. That forgery case, for instance. Fifty thousand dollars had been stolen right from under the noses of the city officials, and all the auditors and city detectives and private detectives they called in had to admit that it was too deep for them. Then they called in Dad, and he cleared it up in three days. Once he got suspicious of that slick bookkeeper, whom nobody had been suspecting at all, it was all over but the shouting. Got a confession out of him and everything. It was smooth work. I'm glad our suggestion helped him. 
The case certainly got a lot of attention in the papers. And here we are, said Joe, plugging along the shore road on a measly little errand to deliver some legal papers at Willowville. I'd rather be on the track of some diamond thieves or smugglers or something. Well, we have to be satisfied, I suppose, replied Frank, leaning farther over the handlebars. Perhaps Dad may give us a chance on a real case sometime. Sometime. I want to be on a real case now. The motorcycles roared along the narrow road that skirted the bay. An embankment of tumbled rocks and boulders sloped steeply to the water below, and on the other side of the road was a steep cliff. The roadway itself was narrow, although it was wide enough to permit two cars to meet and pass, and it wound about in frequent curves and turnings. It was a road that was not often traveled, for Willowville was only a small village, and this shore road was an offshoot of the main highways to the north and the west. The Hardy Boys dropped their discussion of the probability that someday they would become detectives, and for a while they rode on in silence, occupied with the difficulties of keeping to the road. For the road at this point was dangerous, very rough and ruddy, and it sloped sharply upward so that the embankment leading to the ocean far below became steeper and steeper. "'I shouldn't want to go over the edge around here,' remarked Frank, as he glanced down the rugged slope. It's a hundred-foot drop. You'd be smashed to pieces before you ever hit the shore. I'll say it's best to stay in close to the cliff. These curves are bad medicine. The motorcycles took the next curve neatly, and then the boys confronted a long, steep slope. The rocky cliffs frowned on one side, and the embankment jutted far down to the tumbling waves below, so that the road was a mere ribbon before them. Once we get to the top of the hill, we'll be all right. It's all smooth sailing from there to Willowville, remarked Frank, as the motorcycles commenced the climb. Just then, above the sharp putt-putt of their own motors, they heard the high humming roar of an automobile approaching at great speed. The car was not yet in sight, but there was no mistaking the fact that it was coursing along with the cut-out open and with no regard for the speed laws. "'What idiot is driving like that on this kind of road?' exclaimed Frank. They looked back. Even as he spoke, the automobile flashed into sight. It came around the curve behind, and so swiftly did the driver take the dangerous turn that two wheels were off the ground as the car shot into view. A cloud of dust and stones arose. The car veered violently from left to right, and then it roared at headlong speed down the slope." The boys glimpsed a tense figure at the wheel. How he kept the car on the road was a miracle, for the racing automobile swung from side to side. At one moment, it would be in imminent danger of crashing over the embankment, down on the rocks below. The next instant, the car would be over on the other side of the road, grazing the cliff. "'He'll run us down!' shouted Joe in alarm. "'The idiot!' Indeed, the position of the two lads was perilous." The roadway was narrow enough at any time, and this speeding car was taking up every inch of space. In a great cloud of dust, it bore directly down on the two motorcyclists. It seemed to leap through the air. The front wheels left a rut, the rear of the car skidded violently about. By a twist of the wheel, the driver pulled the car back into the roadway again, just as it seemed about to plunge over the embankment. It shot over toward the cliff, swerved back again into the middle of the roadway, and then shot ahead at terrific speed. Frank and Joe edged their motorcycles as far to the right of the road as they dared. To their horror, they saw that the car was skidding again. The driver made no attempt to slacken speed. The automobile came hurtling toward them. End of chapter 1